Hey guys, welcome to the super duper surprise midweek bonus episode. Uh, so many adjectives uh, and descriptors that it boggles the mind. Uh, what we're doing here actually is celebrating the end of this unbelievably triumphant 2022 Pavement Reunion Tour with our first ever repost of an episode. Uh, one of the coolest things of uh, a limitless amount of things about this show is that the very first guest we ever had was Spiral Stairs, Scott Camberg himself. We did Roxy Music, which is an unbelievably great choice for him to have made. So with um, original co-host Joe Kennedy, we tackled Mount Roxy with Scott and uh, we'd like to share that for you. So here's a flashback to December 2021 and Pavement Congratulations, guys, on an incredible tour. Welcome to Discography, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm Joe Kennedy. And I'm Dave Gebro. We have a super special guest today. Should we, should we uh, bring I would even a, venture to say he's a super duper super, special guest. <laughs> Turbo super duper special. <laughs> yes. Uh, we would like to, uh, we are honored uh, to welcome fellow music obsessive Scott Canberg, a.k.a. Spiral Stairs, architect of the seminal pavement sound, not to mention solo star in his own right and figurehead of Preston School of Industry. Welcome to Discography, Scott. Thanks for having me. We are very honored to have you, uh, especially with this band. Yes, yes, my favorite. So my we, favorite. So we kind of collaborated with Scott on this selection. We came up with today's topic: Roxy music, art damaged rockers <laughs> turned psychedelic avatars for a new age. Turns new age lounging, avatars for the post party come down. <laughs> so, do you guys mind if I just throw my hat into the ring first? Sure. Go, okay, go Scott, you cool with that, man? I'm, I'm, I'm. It's all yours, man. It's all yours. Okay, so he, here's why. All right, so I don't mind being a, a bit open about this. I never really knew about Roxy Music until. The first night I ever tried acid. Whoa. Okay, so I had the great good fortune to be with my good friend Jim. Um, Not who, his real name. It is his real <laughs> name, actually. Um, quote, unquote, though. He was born with the quotes around his name. Um, so uh, that night, for the very first time, I, I have this very vivid recollection of listening to The Bogus Man Ooh. while my friend was laying in bed and I saw these question marks dancing around the room. Um, that next day, uh, I woke up, went to the neighborhood record store, which is called All Wilk, and I bought uh, the eponymous first one and For Your Pleasure. Wow. Wow. And it was just, uh, it, what a great way to be introduced to that band. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. My, uh, I wish that would have, I wish that would have happened to me the first time I took acid. Unfortunately, unfortunately, <laughs> I was at a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> Wait, what year was that? Uh, 1984. How do you, uh, what's your recollection of um, first hearing Roxy? Uh, well, the first memory I have of Roxy was probably hearing them on the on the radio when um, "Love Is a Drug" came out. I just remember that song because it was so it was kind of different than than what was on the the classic rock radio. You know, I mean, maybe I'm maybe maybe my recollection's wrong. Maybe I heard it a little later because it was always on classic rock radio. You know, it was always a yeah. It was, I think I was a little older. I'm, I'm, I'm a little younger, but I, yeah. I arrived around the same age that you, because the first thing I remember being exposed to them was um, when they were on MTV. It's 82. Oh. So I'm born in 72. Okay. So I was about 10. Um, and so, you know, More Than This and Avalon were both kind of like early MTV yeah. videos. And I was obsessed with MTV at that time. It's yeah. like the only thing I cared about in the world. I was sure. just the right age. I was like 10. Sure. Um, first really getting into records. 
Um, and it was kind of like only weird bands had videos that first year in like 82. Yep. Yes. It hadn't really gone mainstream. Yeah. So it was this kind of weird, like underground feel to it. That, I that, remember that Relax, did not last. the politics of dancing. Do you remember that song? <laughs> yeah. Mexi- <laughs> Mexican radio. Mexican radio all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The underground nature of MTV did not last very long. No. It was, no, it didn't. But it was great there for like a year or so. It was really yeah. that, that magical. I would just stay up all hours at night and watch that. Yeah. But I, um, And so yeah. I don't think I really got into the earlier records or even until like much later, like in college or something, that I kind of went and I, I mean, I just, I, I only knew them as the Avalon era. Yeah, it was the same. I mean, yeah, I heard, like I heard that song, but 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 I also remember seeing that the, the Country Life record cover in the record shop and going like man what that those girls are sexy like what the what the hell's that, that all about yeah their record their album yeah, cover game no. is top notch <laughs> it is <laughs> so i didn't buy it i didn't buy it because i was too scared to buy it but uh but that was yeah my earliest recollection was in sometime in the 70s for sure joe and i were just talking uh you know before we connected here about you know, Roxy and, uh, you know, Roxy certainly specifically almost being mislabeled a glam band because it's not, yeah. it's almost like calling My Bloody Valentine a shoegaze band. Yeah. That puts everyone else at a severe disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's glam in a way, but then what sort of became yeah. what most people think of as glam is not really like them at all. Yeah, I think, yeah. It, I think it was like, you know, in reading back, in reading b- books and stuff about the time, like, now you you kind of under you can kind of understand that glam was just kind of around for not not that long you know like it was like right what what was it like mark bolin and and ziggy and who who and, i think is totally you know. overrated mark bolin is to i mean yeah. i like those records i, like I wouldn't i would i disagree i i like jeepster i like a few uh cosmic dancers those are some of the songs. sonically most amazing sounding records ever made they sound unreal they sound so good it's just yeah it's just boogie dressed up in silvery <laughs> shoes but that's kind of what amazing. glam was you know it was like it was kind of like not roxy you know no, not no roxy's not roxy the, no no yeah roxy's yeah, different yeah. they're not really glam to me but i think kind of they mis- mislabeled i think they kind of you know they were smarter than that they were i think mark bolin was just trying Absolutely. to trying to change with the times and and uh, yeah. and even Bowie a little bit too, but Bowie Bowie was way more in, uh, intellectual than than yes. uh, any right. kind of anybody totally. was. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it was just another fucking costume change. Yeah. Well, anyway, should we should we uh, <laughs> let should we go to the beginning and dive in? Yeah. Because, okay. Uh, yeah. All the all these things will come up as we go through Absolutely. the uh, through the <laughs> chronology here. The the first thing that that I think uh, that you know bears. Uh, you know, noteworthiness here is, you know, in the early part of 1970, uh, Ferry actually auditioned as lead singer for King Crimson. Oh, God. So they were looking to replace Greg Lake, um, presumably around the islands. No, not islands. Lizard. Lizard, yeah. lizard period. Um, and Fripp decided that, you know, that Ferry's voice was not necessarily suited for King Crimson, but he was like, Good call. Kid, you got Moxie. <laughs> Apparently ch- chomping on a cigar and <laughs> handing out a business card. Yeah. Um, and that's what really was the the uh, the bridge that helped him get signed eventually. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but it was uh, first uh, Ferry hooked up with Graham Simpson. Mm-hmm. That was the the first guy in the band, the bass player. Uh, they'd been in a band together in uh, in college called the Gas Board, and uh, Ferry put out an advertisement. A- Andy McKay answered the ad. Uh, Andy brought his uh, uh, his audiophile friend Brian Eno uh, along at at one point, and uh, he was just going to be a technical advisor. And very fast became part of the band. Mm. Then they became Roxy. Then they found out that there was another band called Roxy. So they became the, the originals. They became the right, original. right. And they changed and the their Silver name, Beatles. Changed their name to the Regulars. And then <laughs> right. Another band across town. And they just became the Thamesmen. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so it's amazing this is how real how real Spinal Tap really is. <laughs> so this is Phase One: Bad Shit E Noise, 1970 to 1970. Cool, we're in a phase. We're in a phase. <laughs> nice. Yep. So uh, Scott. Yep. Have you heard that, you know, on the box set stuff and 
uh, the uh, the re-release of the eponymous record. Have you heard those May 1971 demos? Yeah, yeah, they're all they're fucking awesome. Super interesting. Yeah, they're so weird. Like, like, like they. Yeah, are- the main difference to me is they have they they, they don't have um, Paul Thompson yet. It's a different drummer. Yep. They have kind of a jazzy kind of drummer, kind of a loosey, real loosey goosey yeah, kind of drummer. Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty different take on all the material because Paul Thompson's so like just such a slamming like tight like monster drummer. Um, so it's it's interesting to hear him in a different hear those same songs in a different context. Yeah, it's like it's like the vibe. there's there's that part in that song two HB. It's like there's like this yeah. weird jazz like oh like it's, big like band a, it's like a, it's like so weird yeah, yeah it's like a dissonant breakdown yeah. and in the released version I think to the eventual betterment of the song, uh, but you still lose something. They completely chop that part out. Yeah. It goes on for minutes. Yeah, I know. But it's so... It's interesting. It's, you know, not not just paths not taken, but it was really uh, the reins hadn't been pulled back or yeah. uh, the ideas hadn't yet been given shape. They were just like flailing around like crazy. Yeah. But, it, and it's very, I don't know, I don't, I hate the word proggy, but it's it's kind of like, you could kind of see how they're coming out of the '60s, kind of yeah, all right. this kind of like you know they're, they're do you, do you really in a hate fucking him. mess, you know, like yeah. <laughs> you know trying to. But do you really hate saying the word proggy? Uh, you know, like I prog? just I uh, some prog. I, I mean, Gary Young kind of screwed me up on prog. You that's know? that's exactly. <laughs> thank you for going there because I was gonna try to lead you to that topic. <laughs> I mean, it was it was all yes and. King Crimson and and uh, yeah, but and he didn't listen but. to Je- Gentle Giant and Caravan. Though. Oh, of course he did. Maybe he right? did. Of course did he, he like like the obscure prog? Oh, he loved it all, man. <laughs> oh, he did. Okay, all right. As long as it was. I mean, naughty. it was mostly. It was mostly. You know, then he would get into the Frank Zappa, and then now it's just like, oh, come on, man. Mm-hmm. The bit Roxy they, on these demos, he he already has the synth. He already has the VC three kind of cooking. Yeah, and um, I love the intro thing to the song "Lady." Has, has oh that, like, my god, that's forbidden, awesome. yeah, forbidden, yeah. forbidden planet kind of like sci fi thing to it. Like, yeah, Lady Lady Tron's. Uh, yeah. It's always been one of my very my, my uh, favorites. Yeah. Very artsy fartsy early take on Lady Tron. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I dig it. Yeah, I, and the, and their take on Chance Meeting is really skeletal i mean the bones are there you can really hear how they're at really an art school kind of concern at this point you know yeah i could i could be wrong but that that this could be the actual first thing i've ever i ever heard i mean not the first thing i ever heard the when i went to the record shop and and heard the heard the uh, uh the the weird music i think it was this demo i think it was a boot, oh, wow. bootleg yeah. of this it's, it's super rad it's super cool intro so should we move on to the next one? Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's. Uh, well, first we have to. I, I give it four stars. These, You're right. okay. I know it's four songs, but uh, I would say it's not yet. Uh, it's not yet perfect, but extremely interesting. Yeah. And definitely, uh, you know, more listenable than just of historical interest. Now I give it four stars. I've got a question for you guys. I I don't. I've. I was listening to those demos, but then, but I would always get confused with the peel sessions they did kind of after that. Yeah. That's the next thing, which is like, so the main difference yeah. with the peel sessions is now they have Paul Thompson and Davey O list. Right. Which, yeah, they, which right. they got, they got a couple of new guys in which he, by the time of 72, he like jam, his guitar playing is so amazing. Like, yeah, he sounds really good. He, he, he was kind of doing the same thing that Manzanera eventually ended up doing. That's what like I read. Manzanera yeah. kind of followed right in his. In his he, Manzanera like learned all the parts and stuff. Maybe that's he what had it was, already yeah. had it learned. Yeah, yeah. He already he just he had he was like that's why he was hired. Him. Yeah, because <laughs> he, he, already, knew he already knew everything. <laughs> he knew everything already. Yeah. There you go. So what do you give the demos? I'll give him four stars as well. Um, I, I they're they're pretty listenable. I yeah. Say for demos. Yeah. What do you think, Scott? Oh, I think they're amazing. I'd give them what? What's your? What's your? What do you zero go to zero five. to five? Zero to five. I give them five. All right. Five. Okay. Nice. Nice. So now we are onto the seventy-two Peel sessions, and as we mentioned, they had some personnel changes. They have Paul Thompson, which is a, a radically different sound for them. Now they're this kind of very muscular, punchy, like you know, um, very tight kind of band, um, and like and also David O'List joins. So they're kind of getting close to their final form on these Peel sessions here. And um, they're they're very inspired. Is it is this the final? Are they locked in now, or is Manzanera not? Manzanera did not play on this. Okay, he joined okay. Sh- shortly after this. Okay. 
So yeah, the, this it's I mean it's a classic Peel session. I mean we're talking to one of the uh, great Peel session, a member of one of the great Peel session bands ever. Yeah, they, a special guest today. No shit, <laughs> no exaggeration. Yeah. But, um, but well, because yeah, because you you guys my, um, you guys also, always brought uh, you know stuff that hadn't been released on studio records to the table. That was bonus. Yeah, yeah. It was it wasn't as fun as as uh, as advertised. It was pretty stressful. Uh-huh. Time, see that. time doing those because you're like hungover after a, like a you know ten shows in a row and you're like right you got to go in in the day or something <laughs> yeah. Doing, probably. yeah yeah and then Steve would always say like oh let's just make up whatever and uh, <laughs> I was like all right <laughs> that's all part of the magic <laughs> right because you guys were at odds with the notion of career <laughs> from, <laughs> from day one yes exactly. <laughs> Wait, tell us what it was like being a member of the Generation X. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think I do think the '72 Roxy Peel sessions, and there's a there's a bunch of them. Uh, I think they did it more than once. They did it, in, yeah. um, in the next over the next few years. But the '72 Peel sessions are real classic. I think yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah, me too. I give that four as well. That's great stuff. I gave that five stars. I like that one. Yeah, a lot. I'd give it five as well. All right, so then then we're moving forward to then Manzanera becomes part of the band, and you know we're in the uh, the spring of seventy two, and you know really the the shaping and refinement of the magic. When I think of like the the great album sides of all time, the first side of the Roxy Music debut record is definitely up there. Mm. It's perfect. Yeah, uh, there's other great stuff on the second side, but that first side. It's a dream. Yeah, yeah, and it's we and it's weird too. It's just like, um, it, like if you were a kid in in seventy two listening to that for the first time, it probably probably scared you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yep. They just make a great racket together. They just play great together on, on this. It's like the, it seems like the material is like really well fleshed out. Um, it's like really arranged. There's a lot of color and everything. You know, it's like Andy McKay's sax stuff is really interesting. So, all right, so let's go, let's just go song for song on this one because I think this uh, this deserves it. Let's talk about remake remodel being the mission statement. Yep. I mean, both lyrically and musically for uh, a whole new way in music. Uh, it's basically a pastiche of all these different styles that they threw into the blender uh, in this sort of postmodernist mm. frap. And, you know, yeah. I mean, this was, there's almost no better for a song for a band to have. Yeah, and then, and also, like, you know, it's pretty badass to go, like, all right, you know, bass player, play your little solo. You know, guitarist, yeah. your solo. Oh, Eno, do your little solo, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like everybody has that. It's like a, it's like a you know, a big band or something starting. Yeah, yeah. Getting it's interesting up. you mentioned post postmodernism. It's sort of like th- this is kind of like uh, without getting super like rock critic on this. Uh, you know, it, th- this is kind of to me like the embodiment of what postmodern music is. It's that kind of like it's not really like a it's not like a repudiation of what came before or a continuation of it. It's like a synthesis of things that came before. It's kind of like a mm. there's kind of irony built into it. And it doesn't respect like uh, boundaries in certain ways, like you know previous artistic boundaries. It's kind of pushing those kind of boundaries. There's like clash between high and low art kind of happening. You know, there's, there's it's, it's, a lot of actually th- things that are similar to uh, what pavement meant to me in the '90s. Mm-hmm. I mean, pavement was kind of postmodern in some similar ways. You know, embracing contradictions. Um, those are kind of some of the like kind of pillars of postmodernism in music, and they, nobody really re- represents it to me better than Roxy. They kind of like yeah. really define that. <clears throat> you know, um, it's something Plus, it's something the, the, new. Their level of self belief. You know that uh, the concert footage of them. It was a TV appearance. Great whistle test. That's great, great, yeah, great that's the, that's the one. And Ferry is staring down the camera, and he's winning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really striking footage. Uh, I mean, that's a band with insane amounts of self belief. Yeah, yeah. They, he was he was good at that. You know, yeah, I mean, he was a little older, so he probably already kind of he probably already knew kind of like what would work. Yeah, he's already a very polished performer. Yeah. You can see, yeah. especially in that Grey Whistle Test um, performance. But yeah, everything on side one is incredible. So like Ladytron, 
it kind of has lady a, trying to the, the fi- it sort of has a 50 sci-fi kind of callback the his, the anime case oboe kind of reminds me a little bit of like the oh, synth and like telstar or something it is you know? so fucking it has crazy. that sound to me a little bit um just such a killer arrangement just everything yeah. works it just really yeah. plays it's like high art yeah if, if they're let, let's just pretend that um uh, that Virginia Plain is the single that it was supposed to be. So we won't mention it as part of side one. But, uh, of course, that was not uh, uh, initially sp- supposed to uh, in- to be intended on this record. It was it came afterwards. Yeah. Right. Um, if There Is Something is uh, a great song. 2HB especially for me, that, that really gets me every time I hear it, especially that sax breakdown, which... Mm-hmm used to be very dissonant in the de- in its demo version mm-hmm. and then became somehow very uh, extraordinarily emotionally affecting uh, in its released version. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I, it's beautiful. I also love his... Uh, Ferry is kind of a good, really good keyboard player, too. A lot of his little keyboard licks are kind of essential to the songs. I love his... He's playing the pianet on 2HB, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like treated so it's kind of has this underwater kind of sound to it. Um, he's he's a he's also a pretty cool musician in addition to being like you know front man guy. Oh, totally, totally. He's 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 uh, he's the package man. He's it. Now, it's another pretty big <laughs> weapon. I mean, these guys are all amazing players. That's a, just another weapon to have. This kind of like really rhythmic, key, you know, insistent kind of. You know, a lot of his stuff is kind of that like down 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 down. down you know, those kind of yeah. really yeah. insistent keyboard yeah, licks, yeah. and it's kind of a big part of the sound. Yeah, very confrontational. So side two, I I I like side two kind of just as much. Really, it gets kind of rabbit holy, but it really is kind of a contrast to side one. It's kind of like they're kind of laying down the gauntlet. Like we'll we'll do anything, yeah. and we'll take this. We can take this out to places that are weird. I I dig side two kind of just as much. Really, how about you, Scott? Yeah, I uh, I I don't know. I mean, I've it, it all kind of just it's the perfect record. You know, it's not. I'm not really. Um, I can't really judge side one or side two, which is better. I think it all just goes perfect together, and and uh, uh, the songs are just so epic. I mean, there's only one. Yeah, like Chance, Chance Meeting, that one is like, that one has like a real like kind of melodrama to it. That is know? weird, yeah. You know? Such cool shit on that. Well, that's very this dramatic. Is hands down, hands down five stars. Yeah, and five stars. Out. Yeah, easy. Definitely. I mean, every song really kind of be on the playlist probably almost yeah. everything you know? yeah yeah um, i mean the only ones i wouldn't put on the playlist would be the bob and sea breezes mm-hmm. but uh we could put them I, all I on. think you got you gotta have the bob you gotta have the bob <laughs> then the bob goes on <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, what's next you want to take the, yeah the, so uh, two months uh henceforth from the uh from their debut record being released uh, you, they release a single because that album is not enough. Virginia Plain backed with the numberer. Uh, Virginia Plain being one of the, all, I mean, it's one of the all time greatest songs. Yeah, one of the butt kicking song. Yeah. It's a completely perfect piece of music. And the stop start sections with Eno's uh, crazy synth squiggles mm-hmm. is clearly a, not just a great section, but a, clearly a way forward for music. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. It's it's an insanely good song, iconic. I would say. Yeah, I mean, and, and they know it too. Me and you, just we two, got to search for something new. They know it. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's and uh, the the B side's pretty cool. The number is kind of one of those kind of you know, it's a kind of a oldies kind of take on oldies like fifties kind of vibes. Yep. Yeah. Um, kind of repurposing those into something really new. It's it, it's a it's a pretty cool B side. Yeah, there's some weird shit in there. It's some it's what sounds like a synthesized penny whistle solo. You can see why it was a B side. It's like maybe a slight cut below what was on yeah. the record. Yeah. But uh, as a B side pretty cool. Yeah. But it's the start of, it's the start of their B sides, you know, like for me the B sides are uh, they're not the best B sides. Of a band. No, like a band, they are you know? clearly B sides. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. Like like it's just it's weird that that they have such great album tracks, but then they don't even just have one great B side. <laughs> yeah. No, know? wait, wait, can, wait. I actually <laughs> I, I would like to disagree with you on that one. We'll get to that though. All right. <laughs> uh there's one. There's only one. <laughs> Look, it's in there. Don't worry. Okay, we'll okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Hold mentally, your fire. Hold mentally your fire. Book barking. Okay. <laughs> um but uh, before we actually stick this with a rating and move and sully forth, um, there is an artistry that's involved with an amazing lyric. B 
being uttered before an incredible solo. <laughs> so me and you, just we two got to search for something new is up there, okay? I'd like to throw some others in the ring, okay? Um, uh, and then my mind split open before uh, Little Johnny Jewel, the Little second Johnny guitar Jewel. solo. Oh. Um, uh, I heard her call my name, and then my mind split open. I know one that I don't like at all, the intro to a guitar solo, which is Edge Play the Blues. That can, <laughs> oh, fuck, that can fuck straight off. Yeah. <laughs> that can fuck all the way off. <laughs> <laughs> okay guilty pleasure yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were good up to in the early 90s you don't think so yeah sure oh, yeah. just that edge play the blues oh just that moment <laughs> yeah yeah i don't mind them in general yeah but that i hate yeah <laughs> uh you don't think they were cool with that line down south <laughs> all right so uh i give that five stars for sure we're Virginia talking about the Plan. totally the totality of the single oh yeah that's five yeah, stars. yeah five yeah. stars yeah. all right so then uh the rest of 72. i'm assuming scott you're five starring virginia plane yes i don't want to speak for you but yep. it's kind of yep. self-evident <laughs> i'm sorry it was so implied i just steamrolled i'm sorry <laughs> Um, all right, so then the uh, rest of 72 goes by without recorded incident. Uh, March 73, they release Pajama Motherfucking Rama, backed with The Pride and the Pain, yep. an, an astounding single. Scott, take it away. Oh, it's one of my favorite Roxy songs of all time. And uh, again, like, you know, it, it's, it's one of those songs that when I've gone back in time, I always forget about because it's not on any record. And um, and when I hear it, I'm like, holy shit, I forgot about that one and how great it is. And and uh, eh. I don't think I ever really appreciated it until for this going back and listening to it for this podcast this time. It's, it's so it has a real high, like fun factor to it. I, I've always loved it. And what I love most about it is the way that it just sort of buoyantly floats there the yeah. way the yeah. And I was really listening close to it to see what was making that creating that effect. And I think it's just that um, that Morse code pattern synth thing mm -hmm. that threads its way through uh, through the song, and then that the sax is great on this. It's super yeah, yeah. super like alien sax in this one. Totally, yeah, totally alien. Yeah. This is kind of like uh, one of those tunes of theirs too. They, they were really like this. I feel like most in the Eno period, where just every sound is very curated. Mm -hmm. like they can kind of like throw a kind of kitchen sink of sounds at you, but then they're all like kind of amazing totally, sounds. Totally, totally. Like every sound is kind of like mangled in some way yeah, I, or like treated in a way. I, uh, you know, I kind of, I never realized that when I first heard Roxy in the old days, but like when I started listening to Devo and I, and, and I listened to like Mission of Burma or someone like that, mm -hmm, like they yeah. kind of have those moments of where they put that little, little bit of sound, you know, that they warp in some way to fit a, yeah. to fit a song. And, uh, and, Roxy does that, like you said, like it's curated. No, but Mission of Burma has that guy. Totally. They have an Eno. They do. What, what's yeah. his name again? I can't he remember was, his name. He was, um, he was the guy who would mix them, and then he would just mix. Martin yeah, he did and... like live, uh, he fucked with you it's live. kind of like, he would, like they would, he would, they would feed the mix into like a tape machine or something, yeah. and he would yeah. kind of mangle it that way. I think that's what he did, um, yeah. And then it's on the records, too. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a similar kind of thing where it's just that that it's uh, on it's it's got its surface level, but then they <clears throat> they just add so much color. Perubu would do it too. Yeah, yes. yeah. There's just kind of so much information in the frame, mm -hmm. like and in a way that's also not overdone too. I asked I asked David Thomas once if he liked Brian Ferry and Roxy Music, and he was just like, "Yeah, they were good. They were a good college band." <laughs> what the fuck dude i gotta say easily the, my favorite stage name of all time is crocus behemoth <laughs> there is no cooler stage name i'm sorry no offense spiral <laughs> exactly um right, so, so pajama rama single uh, five stars. Yeah, five stars five stars for sure they're racking up a lot of fives right now wow. so that same month is for your pleasure yeah um so they spent a lot more time in the studio. You can hear it. Um, there's more elaborate production. The songwriting by Ferry goes into some seriously dark places that he kind of knew uh, was kind of the last time he'd be looking around that particular room, so to speak. Uh, and actually, I believe, intentionally says goodbye 
to that that part of his psyche mm-hmm. at the end of uh, the title track. Um, but you know, this is we got to go through song by song on this one. This was, uh, uh, you know, let's just say that Eno is e- extremely present mm-hmm. on this record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, to the you know, you know, gives a lot of texture to this record. He's filling in a lot of the empty spots. It's it's a little bit different approach on this record with for him. I feel like he's kind of like taking on a more textural kind of role. A um, lot going on in there. He's kind of like filling in a lot of the cracks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's very very prominent on this. This is you can really hear his influence a lot. They had they had, they just had a lot of great material for this record. This is kind of more this this is more just straight like everything's kind of song song song. It doesn't really have the rabbit hole thing on side two that that the debut record has. But they had just so much strong material. Really, every every song is a, kind of a banger. Wow, they got the I mean the they've got the jams. You know the 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 kind of uh, the every dream of heartache and bogus man jams, you know, that are just, they, they do that on a few other records too, like later on, but, but like these where they just kind of suck you in and, you know, yeah. just like this really great kind of, kind of velvet underground kind of thing. But, um, and like I said, my favorite, uh, line before a solo and every dream of heartache, um, <laughs> Every dream yeah. of a heartache, you know. I blew up your body, but you blew but my you blew mind. My mind. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> that yep. is great. But, uh, yeah, that is every. Great. I used to always have this competition with my my buddy here in San Francisco, like best solo, best solo, you know. And he would always say, "Oh, some King Crimson solo, or whatever." And I, <laughs> and I would always say, "This is my favorite." And and uh, I finally got to see Roxy Music. I never got to see them, you know, in the eighties or whatever. I finally got to see them in two thousand. Uh, 2010 when they did that or maybe it was 2011 in Australia uh-huh. right. and uh, <laughs> they played the song and I was like you know standing up and I was just like yeah okay when when that line comes I'm gonna fucking <laughs> scream it out right <laughs> so so it's like blah body she blew my mind so I, I stand up and I yell at that line <laughs> And then I look around me and like the whole crowd's still sitting. <laughs> My father in law is looking at me like I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I think oh, I think creepy. Manzanera even probably heard me because I think he kind of pointed out there and looked at me. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. funny. They still had the core they had it was still the four guys, yeah. right? That, yep. uh, right in, in two thousand ten, yep. right? Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Well, knowing that, I'll never feel terrible about heckling you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave's, a ser- Dave's a serious. He's, he's a serial heckler. I really am. Okay. It, it, I, I believe that heckling, uh, if you're not an asshole, is just um, it's just a way to communicate. Oh yeah. If you have something intelligent to say, not just free bird. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I love it. But, uh, Did you heckle? You heckled Lou Barlow, right? I, I heckle everyone. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Archer's a loaf. Harry Nielsen. Harry Nelson. Arthur, Arthur Lee. Arthur Lee was a particularly memorable one. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, yeah. back to for your pleasure. Okay, so uh, my fa- my that's a great story, by the way. That uh, my the one that hits me the hardest, where it, uh, it you know it's interesting because they this is a band that's very much about artif- artifice, but they have some profoundly emotional experiences that I've had listening to their records mm. no more so for me than Beauty Queen mm. mm-hmm. yeah. I love Beauty Epic. Queen awesome. that initial keyboard flare always sounded like a roaring fire to me mm. um, and then uh, and that jam in the middle it's kind of like they go into like crat rock kind of land for it. Like they become like Noi or something for a minute yeah yeah, yep. yeah with that uh, that regal fuzz slide yeah that, that kind of just feels like that. anything can kind of happen on, yeah. on that right song yeah, yeah I'm I'm, I'm I'm interested in like because you know I've read a couple of Roxy books and they never really go into like um, kind of the recording of these records, you know, like mm-hmm. they never go into like uh, you know like like Fairy came in with these like skeletal skeleton versions of songs or he had the full songs, uh, you know. It's like I I kind of be interested in finding out where 
you know, yeah, how they actually, were. You know what? There's a when I was doing the research for this show, I came across a website that's done by like Roxy super fans, like kind of an aggregator. Yeah. Of, and, and there is some stuff like that on there. We'll, we'll put a link to that. I don't know if the top of my okay. head, but we'll put a link to it in, in our uh, show notes and I'll email that to you, Scott. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's cool to read. It's, produ- kind of production wise, okay. you know, the thing that jumps out at me uh, where it's like, OK, these guys have a clear idea of what they're doing here because it's, it's such a bold choice is the way the instruments hang in midair mm. on For Your Pleasure and how dryly his voice is recorded when he sings, old man, do every step. <laughs> that is just weird. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like you really feel like you're ensconced in total strangeness yeah. when you're listening to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that has that the, a lot of those curated kind of sounds uh, that we keep talking about. Like the, the piano is through some kind of warble warble making <laughs> device. Like it has that kind of underwater thing again. There's the beautiful like a uh, reverby guitar and lots of things have these like long reverb tails. It's kind of like a whole little. That, that's one of their kind of like most weird and wonderful little sound worlds they made on the title track. Yeah, it's it's it's. It's almost like Brian Ferry was just trying. It was like the only records in his collection were from like the 30s and 40s. You know, like right. he was like channeling these these like uh, you know these kind of crooners and big band guys and um, yeah, but yeah. it's fed through like a like a late night monster movie sausage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like it's like it's like that postmodern thing. Yeah, 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 thing, maybe, you know? yeah. Yeah, I love uh, the Bogus Man. That one kind love of, that, um, yeah. you know, that one apparently I'd never really knew this, but on that same website I was just talking about, the Roxy fan site, yeah. that one's kind of contentious among their fans. Some kind of love it, some hate oh, it. Yeah. But I love that tune. I to me, it. it's it's it has a real discipline to it, even though it's kind of a long form, really just a jam. Yeah. It kind of never loses my attention, even at, at its length. You know? And the- I always incorrectly remember it as an instrumental. Because his voice is such a, you know, sort of wallpapery effect kind of a thing that I never even think of it as a song song. Yeah, and the and the, I think around that time they did some TV performances like music laden or whatever too, that where they play it and it's just incredible. Yeah, it's so good. They they sounds just like the record. Yeah, they really had that. They they were uh, they they were kind of had that thing that like really great bands have where they, there's you just need those particular people to make that sound. Mm. You know, yeah. it's their chemistry together, the way they played. Yep. You know, the, like uh, the, the guitar and drums and Ferry's keyboard stuff. They just, they play, they, you know, sometimes that just happens with their combination of people. They go in a room, they start playing, and it just sounds good. Yeah. You can't and, really explain why. And it's interesting because, you know, they are hitting on something that is once in a lifetime. But, you know, guys like this at at a time like this in their career, they're moving fast. Things are changing fast. Their sound is changing. They're just like, you know, doing all they can just to keep up. Uh, And then all we get for it is basically like approximately 12 months worth of material. Yeah. I've incredible. Yeah. Kind of all packed in there. Totally. This is uh, to me uh, as far out a point in the possibilities of pop music that, I mean, it's not even been matched since, I don't think. I give this five stars for sure. Five stars for me, too. I mean, this also has, you know, it it shows kind of everything they can do. Um, There's a couple of great rockers. There's, like, the great kind of long-form thing. There's the really pretty, there's the, you know, kind of ghostly ending, the really beautiful ending. Um, Yeah, super, you know, this is an easy five stars. This is, you know, an absolute classic. And, you know, um, it kind of, I think, like, uh, the song Editions of You, yeah. It's another one I really like a lot. That's Great almost song. like kind of like a pre-punk. If you've never heard Roxy music, yeah. just put that on. If you'd like that, continue. If not, you're, you know, that's pretty representative of like their strengths to me. Yeah, I agree. What do you think, Scott? What do you rate for your playlist? Oh, it's number. It's it's definitely five. It's up there. Yeah. Up, up there with me. Phase two, art damage, snakeskin shedding, 1973 to 1979. So we kick this off. Although not technically to be to be rated or given a rating, uh, we just want to look at Brian Ferry's first solo album, These Foolish Things, released in October 73. The reason why we just want to mention that is because he has mentioned it was more than anything else uh, profoundly affecting on his writing style, which is in keeping with Brian Ferry's aesthetic because it's 13 cover songs. (laughs) 
So all about the surface. Um, but uh, definitely a departure from Roxy Sound. It's kind of like the production on the, on the on that record's a little bit like kind of Roxy Light. Yeah. It's it's it's, yeah. it's in the same universe. It's just it's kind of more about his vocal. It's very kind of more straightforward. Um uh, I kind of like the sympathy for the devil cover in that. It's kind of not bad. Yeah. I've... For me it's all about Hard Rain's Gonna Fall and River of Salt, the mm-hmm. first two. Yeah, I mean he does a good job at at that at those things, but then like I don't know. I mean I to me it's I would have never done that if I was him at that age, you know, and and yeah. had Roxy I going. also don't really, it didn't seem to me like his songwriting changed very much, at least not right away. It seems like it was a little later he had a shift in the songwriting. I, just, I feel like the next uh, few records I, I, are kind I of almost always think of it as like he's trying to get out of his contract or something. I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> There's always stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, but for, no, for him though, for you and I, or for whomever, this would certainly be, you know, let's just do a fucking album dump here. Yeah. But um, for him, yep. because, you know, he's looking at Surface, uh, this was a, a this was a paradigm sh- a paradigm shift. Yeah, I think it was him. kind of important to him. Yeah, the next month after his solo record, um, we have stranded. So I had never really gone through these kind of you know I kind of knew some of the kind of more famous songs in these, but I, didn't, I never I don't think I really got too deep into um, either stranded or country life. Siren, yes, Siren, I, I've always been a fan of, but so a lot of these were kind of new to me. Some of the deeper cuts on these. Um, <clears throat> This record holds up pretty good. So Eno has left the band at this point, mm-hmm. um, and but they replace him with Eddie Jobson, who is no slouch in his own right. He's a pretty interesting musician um, on, on in his own yep. right, you know. Um, so it's not; it doesn't seem like a huge left turn, even with someone as you know monumentally influential as Eno leaving. It seems like they can kind of still pretty much carry on. There's some extremely strong material in this mm-hmm. record. I mean, the the high points of Stranded uh, are are pretty staggering. A uh, couple in particular, uh, Street Life, uh, then the final two, Mother of Pearl and Sunset. Mother of Pearl, especially. Uh, you know, it's what it's definitely one of my favorite Roxy music tracks, and it's one of those songs like. You know, you only need to write one of those to sort of get this idea across. He does it so perfectly. Yeah. That whole like uh, post-party uh, self self reevaluation, come down <laughs> vibe thing. Yeah. He really nails it. Yeah, the intro and the weird intro to Mother of Pearl. Like, yeah, that, yeah, that's that, that 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 is. Uh, and then and then all of a sudden you're into the the jam of Mother of Pearl. You know, like it's like weird. Yeah, weird. Mother of Pearl is a super interesting song. <clears throat> it it kind of has like a kind of sleazy kind of feel to it. Yeah, you know, it has a, the, it's kind of creepy at the beginning. Yeah. It's 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 kind of not the most like uh, I think this is kind of more of a uh, it's it's a it's a it's a centerpiece song on the album and I think it's yeah. kind of for the more like adventurous listener kind of yeah. <laughs> it's this one more you think so it's, I, it's, think this, this I think a... it's really kind of like a high art kind of song yeah but then there's like a song for Europe which is like it's like a kind of a typical Roxy later song you know like later <laughs> later <laughs> my, I love there. that there my favorite thing about that is let's have a Latin spoken section and then. <laughs> Another French spoken <laughs> section. <laughs> There's some, you know, that song of Psalm is just a fucking, that's a weird song. Yeah. They're just, Psalm uh, is I don't amazing. understand. It's kind of like they went from the first two records to, to this one is, is kind of like you could see them branching out a lot to all these kind of different styles and, and, uh, um, right. Yeah. Psalm is kind of a different thing. It's, it's kind like of a, a psychedelic it's like a, gospel, like a slow yeah. burn kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I lo- I've always loved Psalm. I, you know, I think for me, there's just Serenade I never clicked with. A song, and now we're splitting hairs now. We're, we're just talking about one of the great bands. Yeah. Serenade never really clicked with it. Song for Europe um, never really made as profound an effect on me. Um, but overall, this is, to me, almost as good as the Eno stuff. Yeah, I would give it four and a half. Mm-hmm. I gave this four... Um, but I, I could I could go four and a half. Like it's it's like I think I think that you're kind of right. It's kind of they're still they're they're still bringing a lot of good material to the table, and they're still the in, the recordings are still very interesting and, and curated. Um, you know, there's a couple kind of bangers that kind of hold up against like Virginia, you know, like Street Life. That song kind of like holds its own against remake remodel Virginia Plain. Yeah. It's kind of another one in that in that category, yeah. and it's as good. And, and then it, it closes out really strong with the last two with Mother of Pearl and Sunset. 
um, so yeah, there's a lot of good material on, on there. It's I always forget pretty, pretty damn good I always album. forget about Sunset. It's like when I hear that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's like it's such an understated Roxy song. You know, yeah, to, it's, to me, it's, like, it's it's kind of like a like a goodbye of sorts. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, yeah. it um, feels like it's a goodbye to that first era. Perfect ending yeah, to maybe. the yeah. record. Yeah, it, to me, it's just like there's all those little moments on on this record where you can you could see like Japan, you know, ripping off right. or mm-hmm. or 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 uh, Adamant or or. Um, or even Bowie, it, in some ways, you know, kind of. Yeah, it's just, it, it feels like it took a little bit of time for um, the influence to kind of kick in. But it's like probably by the late seventies, yeah. people had kind of like uh, were 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 uh, you know repurposing the sound or kind of going for the yeah. sound. Like how they that's that was so it was a very influential record. But some but of the, the some the, of their you know some of their ideas are they're kind of repeating a, a couple things maybe a little bit. But uh, mm-hmm. I think but they're still interesting. Like I just yeah. I think it's. Uh, what are you, what are you going to go ahead and give it? I'm going to give it a 5. 5? Yeah, All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, right at, right at that same time when Street Life was uh was released as a single, they went ahead and stuck a song on the B-side that is really the apotheosis of what Scott was just talking about previously, about how all their B-sides truly belong on the B-side. <laughs> Hula Kula. Cute little throwaway instrumental. Uh, but completely tossed off. I'll give that one two and a half stars. Yeah, I gave it two. All right, it's cool. It's fine. It's like a kind of lap steel workout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, it's not really essential. Two. I'll give it a two. Yeah, two. Yeah. All right. So uh, a year from that point, October nineteen seventy four, uh, you have uh, the B side of Thrill of It All. Your applications failed. Um, it basically it sounds like a B side where not only does it belong on the B side, but it sounds like uh, that it was meant for a vocal. They just forgot to put one on it. Yeah. Uh, this one's totally for obsessives, um, and I guess I'm not one because I give it two stars. <laughs> I give it the same too. My my only note is not essential. <laughs> All right, so November seventy four, Country Life. All right, so this is actually oddly the first record to crack the top 40 in the US. It was number 37. Mm-hmm. Um, Fabulous cover. Yeah, oh yeah. They still have the mojo. They still got the core lineup. So, you know, they got the they they have the the core four guys that you really need to to make the sound and Eddie Jobson's still hanging around. Um so, you know, they're still they're still Roxy musicing. They're still doing the thing. Yeah. They, they're uh this is a, this is pretty much this to me is pretty similar to the previous record in terms of like quality and approach. What what are you thinking, Scott? What, well, what, what's your connection I, with this? I, I love this record. It's uh, like I said, I, I saw the uh, I saw the cover of it when I was when I was a kid and when I was really uh, interested by it, of course. But I never but I never <laughs> bought the record. But when I went back to kind of recently went back into the Roxy wormholes. Uh, this is probably the record I, the second record I was into the most. Um, you know, the thrill of it all is just such a great intro, uh, kind of like street yeah, life. Really kind of like they're street good, life. They're good at that kind they're of thing. They're good at the intros, right? Yeah, yeah they're, 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 they're good. They always have the banger rocker that yeah. starts it, off and the it's, And it's got like the vibe of a galloping horse. Yeah. yeah. And it's if you hear like the live version of that song, it's just so killer. And uh, the other songs are kind of he's. Fairy's kind of songwriting, like the songwriting's a little more classic, you know, like like yeah. Beatles, like three and nine, a little is, more traditional, yeah. And it's it's um, and then the and then those that weird part, like with bittersweet and triptych, you know, those are kind of some. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tri- I love triptych. Triptych is very unexpected. Triptych is it's crazy. very unexpected yeah, when it kicks right? That one is very LSD like. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the one that uh, cl- always stood out to me it was just, in fact, one of those songs where where there was a period of time where I was just so happy that the song even existed. That's how much it had an effect on me. It was Prairie Rose. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's another one that's kind of unexpected sounding. Mm. There, well, this is, I think on the, the, those two songs, Triptych, especially in Prairie Rose, Th- those feel like kind of new territory. Like Triptych yeah. has kind of a kind of neoclassical sort of thing yeah. to it. It has kind of a Baroque kind of sound. Yeah. That's kind of, it was kind of a thing they hadn't really done before. And it's, it's kind of nice and surprising. Also has the, the great curated sound. And then 
you know, Prairie Rose it also kind of has like I'd never heard Prairie Rose. Um, I don't think I ever made it that far into country life, but yeah, it's a great song. Yeah, really great chemistry in the playing. Well, then you can you know Talking Heads ripped ripped off uh, Big Country from that song. I think right. Oh yeah, yeah that mm-hmm. pedal steel part. Yeah, 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 yeah that totally that. makes yeah. sense. Um, now huh. I really uh, you know Casanova. What a what a kind of weird song as well. Like. You know, like kind of. I never snar- liked that snarl. one. I never connected with that one. one. I mean, out of the blue, that's another one that's kind of a staple. Yeah, that's yeah. Kind of always Eddie Jobson. Yeah. That's, that's, Eddie Jobson yeah. showcase for sure. Another really cool song. I mean, this. I also gave this four. It, it, it's, it's it's four is kind of like my rating for like an album that's just very solid, but maybe not like utterly classic. Um, that, that's still like, like I albums that I give fours, I still really like them. You know, I just kind of want to save a level for the ones that are like super transcendent. I'm right there for with you. I mean, I give it four. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not to me, this is not on the same level as that early stuff with Eno, but if you don't allow that to shadow it, it's it's, it's certainly a great record. This record has good high points. The high points, right. are, the high points are really high. I, yeah. I forgot about a really good time. That, that, that song's got some really great melodies in it and, it's a good story, you know, as well. Like, yeah, um, yeah. This this period of the band's pretty. Solid. I, I give it a five. Um, all right. So moving along, September nineteen seventy five, uh, "Love Is the Drug" comes out as a single. We just want to talk about the B side right now, yeah. Sultan esque. Yeah, one okay. of their better B sides, I think. Yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, this is a sort of a kraut rock one off. Yeah. That remains an avenue not taken. It's a really good instrumental written by Ferry with this sort of wiggling worm like synth line that wends its way through until a buzzing swarm of guitar overdub swoops in and overtakes it for the win. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I mean it's if you you know, if you put up against Bowie at the time, you know, it's kind of it's kind of before he, he goes off into uh Berlin land, you know, and Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Scott, you ever have a deck of like uh, oblique strategies cards? You ever like flip through those? Uh, no, but I follow the Twitter account, so it's like I see it every day. <laughs> There's a card that says one of the cards that says, um, "Imagine the music as a moving caterpillar." That's one of the oh, oblique, yeah. th- that hmm. song kind of reminds me. This song reminds me of that That's oblique, cool. oblique strategies card. Yeah, four stars for me for Sultan Ask. I quite like. I give it five wow. actually. Okay. okay, I don't know. What do you- Still, it's still a. It's, you think four it, and a it's quarter? It's a li- I admit it's a little weird to try it's, to rate a song it's with for, the star for, rating. For me, for me, B sides are a very important part of a band's. Yeah. What a band should do, you know, like they should surprise people. They should, they should give someone something really good on a B side, and and uh, yeah. not forty seconds of uh, <laughs> of a keyboard solo. I don't know. So two, you give it a zero. Two. <laughs> two. Two, okay. <laughs> well, you guys, I see right now, I, I'm, you know, the reason I'm being quiet is I'm frantically scanning through your back pages, trying to think of some hastily released 45, and I can't think of anything. <laughs> All right, so October 1975, Siren. Yay. I want to say, I'm going to hand it to you guys to, to run with this football, but I want to say that the, this particular trawl through their discography, it was uh, the most different way that I've ever heard Siren. This was the best experience I've ever had with Siren. Cool. It felt like a culmination and a refocusing and sharpening of the ideas that, that were presented on Stranded and Country Life, uh, whereas previously I never connected with it as much. Mm. Scott, what's your what's your feeling about Siren? Yeah, I mean, I've I never really listened to it until about um, uh, maybe four years ago. I think I was just I was I was uh, in Mexico, just walking down the street and turned on. I was like, I oh, you know what, I'm going to listen to the Roxy records again. And then I was like, oh, I've, you know what, I haven't heard these records in years. I'm gonna I'm just gonna listen to them all one day. And I got to Siren, and I'm like, holy shit. The songs on the... I mean, of course, Love is Drug. I remember that. But all the other ones, I don't think I've ever heard ever before. And hearing it for the first time, all of them were just like the perfect pop songs. You know? Yeah, you know, I got... I bought Siren on tour on vinyl, like before vinyl was really expensive, where you could walk into like Reckless Records and walk out with like a a bag of 20 records for like 100 Mm. bucks. 
Um, and so I got like, I've got that record, I think there, I think I got it in Chicago and I didn't really know it very well. And you know, it was in the kind of a big bag of records I had that I didn't listen to till the end of tour. And I got home and put it on. It was like, wait a minute, this, I, I kind of always overlooked it. Like this record's classic. This is record's incredible. Um, so, and that was maybe 10 years ago. So this has kind of always been one of my favorites. It's my, um, it's my number one record. Of the Roxy yeah. catalog. It's probably the most airtight record hmm. that they made in terms of like the, the really high quality control. They maybe don't hit the like super high highs, but there's there's a real like kind of, I don't know, it's very disciplined and focused, this record. Well, I want to ask a question of Scott. Mm. So you're saying that you've, that this is your favorite band, but you've only really heard Siren about four months ago and this is your favorite? Uh, yeah, basic, or no, about four years ago. Um, mm. Oh, four yeah, years yeah, ago? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I think this yeah. one gets overlooked a lot. I think it does too. I mean, it's, it was, you know, they, they basically quit right after it, you know, and then, uh, it's maybe the most song oriented record they yeah. did that it, I think relies on the songwriting more than any of the production design or arrangement. It's just, the songs are all like really well written. It, and and there, it, a lot of catchy kind of hooks. Yeah. The thing that, that jumps out to me about it, listening, I'm listening to everything back to back is that the, songwriting ideas like the, the the either the vibe and or the um the, con- you know, the, the feel concept. of it yeah. is just refined and just so much sharper it's in the production but also the the writing and the production are are dovetailing here um in a way that i really hadn't noticed before i mean there's almost every song is just a, a killer here yeah. Uh, it it's a great record. Uh, I never really uh, knew it before. I always thought it was the weakest of the first five. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely not. But I definitely give this five stars. But, you know, <laughs> "Love Is the Drug" is probably the their biggest song. Be, you know, besides maybe Aval- "Avalon" or more than this, I guess. But but "Love Is the Drug" to me is is the ultimate Roxy song. Yeah. Love is the drug to me sounds like the song like Duran Duran built their stick around. Yeah. When you mm-hmm. think of like girls on film or something, it's kind of like a similar kind of like yeah. that guitar stab kind of thing that's in Love is the Drug. Uh, anyway, if I haven't five starred Siren yet. Yeah, I'm five starring this five. Star in I'm slapping this with a fiver. This is, this um, is almost too many good songs to talk about. Yeah, yeah I mean they're all they're all great. So the next year so I mean the band basically for all intents and purposes had broken up. Uh, in July 76, they released a live record called the Viva. Uh, we don't normally talk about live records. Uh, however, this one is worth mentioning mainly because of the song choice. And I kind of have a, uh, uh, I, I have a theory about it. So these are performances that are compiled from between 73 to 75. And <clears throat> the song choices are really out there. I mean, including a really long version of Bogus Man, uh, Pajama Rama, um, Chance Meeting. These are strange choices. And when the band got back together and, you know, started creating new music, it was in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like this live album, it's usage in their discography is just to kind of shut the door for good on all the weirdness. The, the live record, the Viva Roxy Music live record, it, to me, it's uh, I, I agree with you about the song selection. It's a pretty cool selection of songs, but it also, it does have the good flow of like a good live show. It yeah. kind of comes out with a rocker, then it's like pajama rama, which is really fun. Then it has the big epic jam, bogus man. Then there's kind of a mellow out section. Then another rocker. That, you know, it's like it kind of flows like a show, um, and it's a it's a cool live album because it shows a lot of different things they can do. Um, it, it's not necessarily just packed with all the quote unquote hits. It's I think it holds up on its own really well. And yeah. It's I, I, didn't, I didn't I had never heard it at all, but it's super cool. If I yeah, if I was a fan back then, I would be really happy that they released that. I mean, yeah. yeah, live albums usually aren't really my thing, but this one is quite this good. one. This one bears bears mentioning. Mm. I give I give it four stars, even though we're not supposed to. <laughs> kind of an iconoclast in that sense. <laughs> I didn't rate it, so I'm just doing it on the fly. I'm gonna give it four and a half. Nice. I'll give it a five since it was the first right. first second one I bought. You're making us sound like assholes. <laughs> hey, I give it four and a half. That's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I did. I did name my daughter after this band. So, guys, come on. All right. Oh, cool. <laughs> cool. Well, well, it's her name, Roxy. Yep. Oh, oh, that is I awesome. R O X Y. Yeah. The the uh, the nurse said, uh, 
when she was at the hospital, when she was born, the nurse said, uh, what? What's her name? Roxy. That sounds like a stripper's name. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what you name your child. The nurse should never say exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where are we up to now? We're up All right. to... All right. So we are... Um, all right, so the now band they, the band breaks up. The band breaks up. They reunite during 1978 uh, to record Manifesto, but they've reshuffled the cast a little bit. Uh, apparently, Eddie Jobson, as uh, as essential as he was to Out of the Blue being such a, a huge success, reportedly not even contacted for the reunion. He had other gigs. Yeah, he was doing his own band, UK. Right. Right. Was that uh, Bruford? I think it's John Wetton is in that. Right, right. I might be wrong. I'm not really so up on my late Probably a favorite of Gary Young. <laughs> um, okay, so the sleeve of Manifesto indicated that uh, that these guys consisted of Ferry, Manzanera, McKay, and Thompson, along with Paul Carrick, who is uh, the Later guy from Squeeze Ace. And Squeeze. Yeah. Uh, and Alan Spenner. Gary Tibbs, uh, despite everything else, uh, mentioning that Roxy had four people yeah. in it. So anyway, now we're in phase three, tucks and tails, smooth prevails. I'm going to call it 79 to 83, even though you could certainly say to present day. So this phase kicks off in February 79. Uh, the song Trash was released as a, as a single. Trash 2 was the B-side. Get, giving it an even more perfunctory vibe this time around. Uh, I give it three stars. It's uh, this. This is not exactly what you'd be waiting for years to hear. But you're talking it's not about so the trash backed with trash two single. Ma- mainly, I'm just talking about trash two because trash is on manifesto, I'm which I'll soon be reviewing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gave trash two on its own right two stars because I like trash one better. Yeah, I I, I would I would be the same. I, uh, it sounds like they just did another take of yeah, it, and they're, they're like, yeah, they like, yeah, that was Much like a slower one. It's like to go with the fast. It's like one. a soft arrangement. Yeah, yeah but it also it kind of um, it, it's also kind of like, you know, it sounds like what's coming up in the next record a little bit more too. You know, like that slower, mm-hmm. fairy kind of uh, version of stuff. Um, yeah. So this I, era, when they get into manifesto, they're kind of becoming a little bit different kind of band. Yeah. They kind of, you know, the, the, you know, I guess we're on to Manifesto now. The main thing that's kind of, well, one of the main things that's kind of a bummer to me about Manifesto is the mix. Mm. Like it doesn't, the, the, their, every record they've made up till now has this very in your face, punchy, like ass kicking kind of sound. And this one kind of sounds kind of thin and not, it doesn't really leap out of the speakers the same way. It's really noticeable if you play it like back to back with, you know, one of their big, yeah. you know, like Virginia Plain or something. Yeah. You know, the, the, the mix is getting a little bit more washy. Scott, do you like this record? Uh, well, one of my favorite songs is "Manifesto." Of all of mm-hmm. all their songs, I would I would rate I would, that would be in my top ten. They're kind, of, yeah. They're <clears throat> it, it seems like this is like the first kind of step on the journey to like on the on the kind of new wave yeah. kind of. Well, even the song "Trash," like you know, that's kind of like it, that song's somewhat cool, but it's like yeah. it seems like they're following a trend rather than creating it. It's kind of they're kind yeah. of doing like a Steve naive yeah. Farfisa thing, yeah. And it seems like they're kind of like they're they, you know where they're not ten steps ahead anymore. No, they they actually strike me as very far behind. Yeah. I, I don't know, you know, to to me, uh, you know, it, there's as much of a step down as like. Going from Big Star's third to in space. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I mean, if you look at the videos around that time, it's like it's hard. They're hard to watch because they're that Gary Tibbs guy is like dancing around with his bass and you know, and he's kind of like, like he's kind of like a he's like a kind of a Kmart Jocko. He plays fretless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of. It's just like, well, what happened, guys? <laughs> yeah, fretless, Kmart, <laughs> fretless. Kmart Jocko is a great title. <laughs> fretless bass is kind of a very unpunk rock instrument yeah. <laughs> by nature. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple things I like on this. I like the song Angel Eyes a little bit. That's kind yep. of more straightforward, but it's kind of like. Uh, that's that's kind of a pretty good straight ahead Roxy yeah, time. Yeah, oh, this rec right. this record to me is a seven ten split. Yeah, you got manifesto kicking things off in grand style. That is a great song, and spin me round. The very last song is a beautiful little ballad. That's one um, of the better songs. That's a playlist worthy song. 
But then in between is a fucking Sahara for me. It is for me too. It's like I really. Yeah, they also it. kind of start using the, uh, the the what's known as the Yamaha CP70 piano a lot on this, <laughs> which is kind of um, like the it's like you know it's like the Kiss on My List piano. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like a, very much a kind of of its time. It's really not my favorite sound, um, and it's it could, it's pretty prominent. Like there's one there's that song Stronger Through the Years, which is kind of built on a CP70 oh. thing, and then. Gary Tibbs is kind of like kind of farting around on the fretless bass, and it's really long. And what do you think that one? I s- strongly dislike that. What song. do you think? What do you think the idea was with side one, east side, side two, west side? That was I never even that noticed was that. Interesting. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't sound like there was a lot of thinking behind it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's it's probably the remnants of an evening that was chronicled in the first part of Mother of Pearl. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I gave Manifesto two and a half. I give it one and a half. Oh, oh, I give it I give it three and a half because of Manifesto. It also goes to show you again how fast things change because Manifesto is what, 78 or something? 79. 79? Yeah. So it seems like a world has changed since like 75. I know, right. You know, it seems like the like music is so much different in 79 than it is in 75. Yeah. Like that, it, like the like that kind of style of new wave, that kind of that's kind of a cool era of new wave, like 79 new wave. Yeah. Like it kind of hadn't gotten really into the 80s cheese as much, so it's... it's well, we're right at the neck, Although though, we're getting there the now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but next, you still next, have shoes. Right. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so next one is kind of in the same vein, Flesh and Blood. There's a few tunes on Flesh and Blood that sound like kind of like building blocks for yeah, maybe. Avalon, but are nowhere near as... They didn't have the sound figured out. That's, no, that's the thing. No. Like Avalon is really a triumph of yeah. like the sound and the arrangement and the production. And so they're kind of assembling some of the style, but the, the Avalon is just airtight in the way it's, the, the way it's conceived and the way it's like recorded and mixed and, and, uh, and the sound curation, yeah. you know, that, that, that and, and the songs too. I just got to say any album that starts off with a cover of In the Mid- Midnight Hour is basically saying, fuck you, fuck this, and fuck <laughs> yeah, everything. That is, well, the, Flesh and Blood has some real love. The really, the weird, that is the dumbest thing ever to, to put a record on, to put the number first song on. I mean, really, all, there's so many better songs on that record they could have done, you know? Like why didn't they yeah, just start it with oh yeah? It's one of, choice. I mean, oh. it's generally one of the lamest, most unimaginative covers ever. Uh, uh, kind of, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I would agree. Like, why not just like do Brown Eyed Girl, like Mustang Sally? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Land of a Thousand Dances. How about that one? That's an that's a real emotional tearjerker. Yeah. Now they did start assembling some of the team though, because this like Rhett Davies worked on this record a little bit. Mm. Um, he's kind of starting to show up as more of a producer, and then the, and Andy Newmark, yeah, yeah. who played on Avalon, is start. It plays on a few songs. But on I this. love. I mean, so, to me, I love that song "Flesh and Blood." It's like I used to do. A, Flesh and Blood I is great. Co- yeah, that's the best. We, song we did a cover of that in the Spiral Band, and we did a really great cover of our our our. Dear Departed, Matt Harris, ba- he was the bass player. He played such right. a funky version of that. It was great. And um, Yeah, that's my favorite song on the record. Yeah. That's like, I, I'll, I would put that one on the playlist. I love Oh Yeah. Oh Yeah, it's good. And, oh, yeah, and you know really what? I got to say, 8 Miles High, they do a really good version of that. It's a weird disco version. I don't understand. I fucking hate that version. I, I love it. Have you ever tried to DJ I, with that song? It's, it's my great. least favorite song in their entire catalog. <laughs> I, Midnight Hour is worse. It's pre- yeah, they're both pretty bad. I mean, just cover versions don't need to look. After Husker Du's version of Eight Miles High, there never I needed know, to be I another. Know, cover. I know, I know, but it's so weird. It's so weird. This one's a, Flesh and Blood's a weird kind of grab bag record. It's it's yeah. like, it's it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like the mutt. It's like a weird mutt in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not my least favorite. Yeah, it's I give it two stars. I also gave this two. It, there, there are times on it where they sound like because just that CP seventy piano. It sounds like they're like playing at the Ramada Inn yeah. or something. You know, mm. It sounds like they're like a, like a top forty band or something. Yeah. Um, but then the like, same old scene is kind of an interesting song. It sounds like they're kind of doing some like MIDI sequencing, like it's it's, it's almost kind of like uh, like Human League or something in that kind yeah, of space. Yeah. Um, that's kind of an interesting tune. 
Um, like, you know, it's really kind of synth, synth pop kind of tune. Um, My Only Love, that's another one that sounds like it's something that's kind of a stepping stone to Avalon. Now, that's a, so th- yeah, I think that this is, is a, kind of you're this, right about that. Yeah, that one is, you know, this record seems like it's kind of like, you know, it's, it doesn't really succeed, but it's still kind of interesting. Um, I, I gave it two and a half. Um, and, um, I always forget. but it's weird. Always, it's a weird record. Yeah, I always forget. <laughs> what's your, what's your stance? Oh, I always on forget my only loves on there. It's, uh, cause that was, it's such a staple of, uh, the later Roxy reunions and, yeah. and, and fa- I, I went and saw Ferry, uh, um, two years ago uh, and he played that as well. And it's, it's, it is such a, it is a really great song. So I would, I would, I would give this record a three, you know, it's right in between, okay. you know, like it's it, it there's there's moments of it that i that i that are great but then there's moments that are you know that are just the, the last three songs i think are i can't ever get that far on the record yeah, yeah. i i do love the last song running wild <laughs> is, a, is a very good really? song like i mean there's three songs i like oh yeah flesh and blood and running wild running wild's okay but then there it has one really weird element that totally takes me out of it it has like a really kind of like bar band like hammond b3 kind of thing going on oh. <laughs> it just seems so out of place like that bummed me out when i heard that <laughs> All right, so next, we've right, got a couple so of B-sides. Ju- July 1980, the Oh Yeah B-side, South Downs. This is my favorite Roxy flip side. Okay. Uh, it's a synth instrumental by Ferry. Surprisingly effective, seeing as they're not much of a B-sides band, as we've established. Uh, this seems pretty close to the kind of smeared, streaked synth scapes that, that Eno had been fond of creating. So I'm curious if there was a little bit of inspiration that happened there. I give this one four stars. Um, I give this one three and a half. It's this is the kind of thing that what I what I call this like synth goop music. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I tend to like that kind of thing. I mean, you know, it's uh it doesn't really go anywhere. It kind of hangs there. Um, but that's kind of what ambient music does. Some you know sort of. So I gave this. What did I say? I gave this three and a half. It's okay. Uh, I don't know. Again, it's a. Another B side, <laughs> another instrumental B side. Of, <laughs> I, 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 my, my favorite thing about doing this episode with you is that any of the released albums, you are just a saint with your with your reviews, and then you are just you hate those B sides. <laughs> I really do. I really do. <laughs> and so there's another one, Lover, uh, another B side that's from what, the same same old same scene. scene, right? Yeah, um, and uh, all, yeah, it's notable for being one of the one of the few B sides of theirs with lyrics. Yeah. Also featured on the Miami Vice Two soundtrack album in 1986. Oh, wow. Wow. Now this one I kind of like. This one kind of has. It, yeah. it, I will say it overstays its welcome, but there are pretty cool sounds in it. I, I would have liked it maybe half the length, but you can see why it made it into a, a movie like or Miami Vice or whatever. It seems like perfect yeah. for that kind of. Uh, it it, seems, fe- it feels to me like a Michael Mann montage sound. Yeah, it just sounds thing, like so Miami Vice. It kind of suits it well. I give it two and a half. I'm not a huge fan. Yeah, like I gave this three and yeah, a half. Why, the same why, as I gave why is that not on Flesh and Blood and instead of Midnight Hour? You know, like. Yeah, that was that. I agree. That should have been on there. A- anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the the soundscape of uh, Brian Ferry's um, uh, colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, February 1981. We're getting close. Jealous Guy comes out as a single, not because there's any musical merit to it, in my objective opinion, but because Lennon was unfairly slain in his prime. So, uh, Roxy. <clears throat> added a version of the song to their set while touring in Germany, and then they re- recorded and released it in February 81. Uh, you couldn't be faulted for uh, for using this song as a way to illustrate the phrase, by rote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I give it two stars. Uh, I gave this one. This seems kind of more like a solo fairy thing. This doesn't really have any hallmark of being a Roxy Music song. They did yeah. play it in their sets a lot. It was kind of a they they. This was kind of part of their live set a lot after this. Yeah, not my not my thing really. One star. Moving on to May 1982, Avalon is released. Scott, go for yeah, it, man. man. Uh, uh, so this, yeah, this will be my second favorite Roxy Music uh, record. Um, Again, I, I I heard this when it came out, and uh, you know saw the videos and and um, remember them. 
but but again at the time it was like I, I didn't really I mean I liked it a lot but I didn't really get into it because I was more into like television and Echo and the Bunnymen mm-hmm. and and uh yeah. and Wire and um you know that kind of stuff and, and a band that you're you probably know? sick to death of talking about in interviews the fall and the fall exactly so you yeah. know like a, a song like um <laughs> you know more than this it's it's really it it didn't but i but in the back of my mind i was like i've always uh always liked it and then when i went back to it uh recently it's just such a perfect record um, it really holds up it has you know i, I the word it, it's a very tasteful record yeah. um there's a lot of kind of touchstones from that 80s period but it's kind of it's it's like when the 80s still sounded yeah. good Right, like records right. started to sound bad, kind of shortly after right. this. Like this, this has a real class to and it. And the beats, and um, the beats, and they put the B sides on there. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you know, it's uh, F- Phil Manzanera said uh, that by the time you get to Avalon, ninety percent of it was being written in the studio. Yeah. That album was a product of completely changing our working methods. Mm. For the last three albums, quite frankly. There were a lot more drugs around as well, which was good and bad. It created a lot of paranoia and a lot of spaced out stuff. Wow. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, you know, this album this album sort of begat a whole genre unto itself. Yeah. Without this album, you could you wouldn't have probably ABC, Spando Ballet, yeah. certainly Duran Duran. Yeah. Although some of those things were contemporaneous. Like this came out right yeah. around the same time as Duran Duran Rio. I think it was like the same month or something. Yeah. But then, to, um, right was it the really? Time. Yeah, eighty two. Huh. Right yeah, but it time. just this this reeks the eighties, you know. It does. Yeah, it's really the best sound. It's like the <laughs> like eighties production, really at its yeah. best. It was mixed by uh, Bob Clearmountain. Oh, there you go, um, legendary mixer. You know, he mixed like Tattoo You and The River and like Born in the USA, like NXS Kick and Huey Lewis Sports. Like, he's like, you know, like he's a legendary uh, mix mix engineer, yeah. um, and it's a great sounding mix. I mean, it, oh it sounds God. pristine. It's a very pristine sounding album. There's not a bad song on this, uh, on this record, and this is you know as a as a music fanatic, and I'm going to guess I can echo the sentiments of both you gentlemen, uh, this is the kind of experience that you hope for, which is that you step into the self-contained sound world yeah. that isn't necessarily about the song itself, but about that that vibe it creates, that environment. Yeah. Yep. I, Absolutely. I agree. This is, this is also the, uh, the record when you go into, um, I remember from uh, the 90s when Pavement would play, Whenever you go into a new room, the our sound engineer would always play this. Yeah, use it to, to tune, tune the PA. The PA. <laughs> like it was the perfect, yeah. the perfect. The, every everything was a perfect about it to these guys, to where they can get all everything locked in. And um, another one that sound guys always use is um, "Money for Nothing." No, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> the classic God. sound guy tuning the PA. Uh, maybe that maybe that was Bob Clear Mountain too. Uh, it probably was. On this record on Avalon too. So uh, Paul Thompson's not around anymore. Um, I, and but they Andy Newmark's kind of the full time drummer on this one, yeah. and um, I love his playing on this. It's a really kind of understated kind of playing. Um, really cool drum. He was he was in the, the Family Stone during Fresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This record, there's no bad songs. I mean, it's it's uh, it's awesome. And and the funny thing is, this is. Uh, a notion that struck me when I was listening to it just this time. But this is kind of an adult contemporary spin on Another Green World. Mm. Mm. In, in its own weird way, and I'm not even saying that in a, in a pejorative way. It's, a, you know, it's, uh, it's got that sound world vibe to it, where the, the rules of the sound world I can are more see that. important I see, than I see the what, I see what you mean by it, yeah, where it's, it's like it's a, it's a kind of world you're going and inhabiting. Mm. It, yeah. it has that seamless kind of uh, quality to it. Um, yeah. You know, it's just it's, it's it's very classy sounding. Like I feel like I should be yeah, doing like is. some like Dom Perignon. <laughs> yep. It's kind of a a different take of glam, right? So right. this isn't like T Rex or anything at all, no. but it's got a, it's it's a very glamorous kind of sound to it. And, yeah, from glam to glamorous. And, the, and the, yeah. the touches are there, you know, like on the spaces in between. It's like uh, it's like there's that like little trumpet. I think it's a tr- it's a trumpet little. Maybe or maybe it's just a sax thing, but it sounds like it sounds like some big band, like uh, yeah, Duke Ellington a great or, something, you know, or something like it's. 
it's really a lot cool. of great like percussion stuff where you know like really, really like a nice like like little like a conga part or something played through like a nice really nice like lexicon reverb and like a lot of like little tasty little details throughout it's funny this record doesn't even strike me as roxy music it no. just strikes me as this is avalon yeah yeah and then everything else they did was part of their catalog this kind of stands uh on what's a, your what's your favorite what's island. your favorite song on it it would have to be more than this only because that's the perfectly realized platonic ideal yeah uh, with regard to a top line. Yeah, great melody. And yeah, hook. yeah. Hmm. What do you think, Scott? Oh, I'd have to say True to Life. It's, yeah, that's it's, great. Uh, that's a great one. That, 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 that one has a great sounding mix. I, I, I went down a wormhole once where I found the, the demos to this. And uh, oh, wow. True oh. to Life's on there. And it's really, really interesting how they've... How they've uh, how they made it so much better. <laughs> yeah, the final version has the great arrangement, a lot of really cool elements yeah, yeah. in it. The, 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 everything just seems to sit in there just right. Um, Take a Chance With Me is another one where I just, I love the palette on that. It's just a very like grand scale kind of sound. Um, really great verse, chorus, melody, um, really well written song. Um, you know, the title track, another one, like yeah. it has, has a great like aloof mm-hmm. kind of quality, quality yeah. to it, you know? Yeah. Um, th- th- this record really, they got back to making really high art. I yeah. feel like on this album, oh, that's um, where it kind of true. like it, the parts really add up to something kind of like, uh, that takes you somewhere. Yeah. I agree. It's almost like if lifestyles of the rich and famous was not a stupid piece of shit, <laughs> it would be like this. <laughs> if, it, if this record was a house, it would have a really nice fountain in the front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I, I feel like this record maybe kind of fell out of favor a little bit for a while. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it it really holds up as really as well as anything from that. And and their the, yeah, I love and their it. live shows around then were insanely good. You know, like they were just they were a really great, really great live band, really great band. I don't know why they had to end it there. I mean, it's a good choice to end it there, but uh, you it's know. the Seinfeld school. <laughs> Go out on yeah. top. They're really kind of down to just the three of them. At yeah. This point, it, yeah. 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 True. Um, so you know, it's it's you know, it's hard to keep something like that together. I think I long. honestly think listening to it like this, it made total sense. They wanted to make this record. They couldn't do it the first time out of the gate. They couldn't do it the second time, but they achieved it at the third time. I think they were going for this sound to begin yeah. with. They just didn't make yeah. it. Um, five they found, like they found their own spin of new wave. Like they yeah. found they found their own kind of strain of new wave. That wasn't imitating things. It was doing something right. new. Yeah. Right. It took them a minute, but they got there. Yeah, yeah. This one I give five stars for yeah, sure. I mean, I'm also fiving this yeah, one. I would say I would do the same. And then in June 82, uh, the B-side for Avalon is Always Unknowing. It probably should have stayed on the record itself mm. as it's just as good as everything else on Avalon. Yeah, in the CD era, this would have certainly been on the yeah. album, I think. Yeah. I think it, they probably didn't fit on... Just because of length. Oh, they reasons. put their they put the instrumental B sides on, on the record. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's it's a it's a it's a cool song. I think, like I said before, in, in the CD era, that would have made the album. I give this one five stars because five stars it would have sure. it would have made it on the record. It should have been on. Yeah, I I, I can't um, vote. I can't <clears throat> vote because I, I I can't remember it. So <laughs> sometimes I do that. Sometimes I say NA. <laughs> sometimes I give an NA rating. Dave never NAs anything. <laughs> no, no. I, I've usually gone back and reviewed way too much. <laughs> Um, so that's so, it. <laughs> well, so okay. So now these guys uh, toured extensively until '83. Uh, then, then Ferry dissolved the band, and uh, and then that was it. They the guys reformed in 2001 to do the 30th anniversary thing, and um, those shows were pretty good. I, I had yeah. I didn't see them live, but I watched a YouTube of it, and it's there. That, that's pretty good uh per presentation of it they had a big band it was like 12 people or something on yeah. stage so they could kind of cover all the parts and they you know they had someone up there playing the vc3 synth and they did it they did it pretty accurate it's pretty cool and chris spedding's in the band too just yeah which and i know band. eno eno never played with them again right no, no. he was spot there i know that eno to. and ferry um uh on ferry's album frantic he's on a track called i thought which is really good yeah um but uh, but yeah, these guys, you know, they have a, an interesting arc. So to me, you know, they were this like art damaged, uh, you know, 
like writhing mound of insanity. They kind of invented the art damaged thing in, yeah. in rock music. You know, they they like took it to all. I mean, I guess the Velvets were before them, but they're in that tradition for sure. Of like, you know, it's high art. Yeah. It's yeah. Music that's music that's capital A art. Yeah. And then, you know, in the interest of, you know, white gloved glamour, all the weirdness was squeezed out of it eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's either a shitty or a terrific thing based on where you are, you know, what era of the fan you like, the, of the band you like the best. Yeah, it's kind of a long sustained, like, excellence and then a slight dip for a couple of records and then a return to excellence. So it's, I always like it when these have a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I would say, so my top three albums uh, are going to be number three, Avalon, uh, number two, the first one, Roxy Music, number one, For Your Pleasure, and then the worst album would have to go to Manifesto. Um, And I hate when my list is similar to yours. (laughs) I'm going to go change it. But mine's pretty similar. I had Siren at number three. Um, I have The Debut at number two, and For Your Pleasure, number one. And um, my least favorite is also Manifesto. Mm. Sometimes that's Although how it's it really it's a tough toss up though between Manifesto and Flesh and Blood. I would say those are those yeah. are kind of a similar quality to me. Also, but not terrible records though. How they're about, not great, but they're not they're not terrible. How about you, Rabbi? <laughs> um, I would say number three would be uh, um, the first. Uh, you know what? I got to say the first two records to me are like one record. So I'm going to say those two are number three. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tie. Tie. (laughs) Uh, Number two would be Avalon. Number one would be Siren. And then the Hmm. worst would be Manifesto. Yes. I agree with that. That's a good list. It's a striking list. I would I wouldn't have expected that from you, but also <laughs> I wouldn't have necessarily expect uh, that you would have picked this band. Cool. We all have the same mix of four records in the top, I think. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, well, they're definitely they're an important band if you're listening uh, and you don't really know who Roxy Music <clears throat> is. Uh, hopefully you've been pausing all the way to uh, you know to check out the playlist which is so pure perfectly curated that we completely uh, you know the idea of a record company actually packaging and releasing this stuff seems completely superfluous well if you haven't been pausing you can just go now and start right at the beginning and um, congr- and you're welcome yeah you are welcome <laughs> and uh, you know Scott took uh, time out of his his busy day he's finishing up a record he's got a huge monolithic tour on the way uh, Scott is there anything specifically you want to plug or uh, I mean obviously we all know about the big pa- upcoming pavement tour was there anything um, else you want to chat yeah, about yeah just that yeah I've got an, I've got this new record that I'm finishing up that hopefully will be out um, early next year Um it's uh, it's really it's going to be really good. Um, and then I'm I'm going to re-release the uh, 20th anniversary of the first Preston School record. All this uh, sounds gas. Sweet. Um, sometime later next year. And is that going to be packaged with the EP? Oh, uh, I think so. I think I well, I think I'm going to package it with the original EP because I have like a thousand of them left. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That won't that <laughs> that will be the same uh, the same quality uh, that it was originally put out on, but the um, but I am gonna get the uh, the the other vinyl uh, remastered and um, and then yeah then all the pavement stuff and and then I'm gonna uh, there's a lot of a lot of fun stuff coming up um, that I'm excited about and uh, and and I just want to thank you for letting me talk about Roxy and. Um, yeah. and, and go back, back. and yeah, no, go no back, kidding. you know, I, 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 I go through these phases with them where I just, you know, it, it's like, you just listen, listen to it so much and, and then you just can't listen to it for a while. And then when you get back to it, you're like, yes, I love, you know, I love this band. And, yeah. There's always enough stuff in there where it's always sounds kind of new. Yeah. Because there's so much information yeah. in their songs, you know? Yeah. Because to me, it was birthed out of the whole uh, psychedelic experience. They will always be a strange band to me, no matter what faints left and right they make. Uh, and they'll always be a very, very important yeah. band mm-hmm. for me. I, as, as is, was, and will be Pavement, 
and your work, Scott. God, so geez. the confluence of these things <laughs> couldn't be more important to, I know, Joe and I. So thank you so much for coming on. Follow us on the platform of your choice. And uh, uh, please also on twin- Twitter. Twinter. Please on Twinter. <laughs> please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And uh, yeah, subscribe on Spotify or Apple Music or wherever you get your podcasts. And we have tons of sick shit coming up. We're here every Monday doing a, doing a new artist. Come hell or high water. See you next week or in a few seconds if you're so bold. <laughs> Take it easy. Bye-bye.